Hi, this is Paul Schreiber of Synthesis Technology and welcome back. We're going to have a part two of my bonus episode on crystals. Thanks to your comments, which I really appreciate on my Patreon page, I left a few things out and I did a little bit of hand waving myself. So I'm here to correct these things. So the first thing I want to talk about, which number one people wanted to know was, okay, I had the wrong values. How does this affect me and my circuit? So we're going to talk about the three things that it does and the two things you have to worry about. We're going to give a detailed calculation and a little chart I did in Excel to show you a cheat sheet. So if you have a crystal that you have a C sub L, you can look at this little chart and figure out exactly what capacitors that you need, whether it's in a socket or if it's on a board. And then lastly, I made a comment about sometimes the calculations show that you want a 30 picofarad capacitor, but there's really no such thing as a 30 picofarad capacitor. You have to pick 33 or 27. Was I wrong? We'll find out if I'm wrong. According to my wife, I'm wrong all the time. She's right. There is such a thing as a 30 puff cap. And I'll show you what it is, how to find it. And actually, for most cases, that's the perfect value. So let's talk first about those calculations. Okay, so we're back to talking about how to calculate those two loading capacitors. And I decided to go ahead and show you the full equation so you could find out for yourself how to calculate things exactly if you need to. And it's pretty simple. CP are the pin capacitances for the IO pins. And for this example, they're going to be the same number. Also, the two loading capacitors, CX, we also have them to be the same number. And that makes the calculation really simple. Notice that the pin and the loading capacitors are in parallel. So you have one set of parallel capacitors over here in series with the other set of parallel capacitors over here. There's another capacitor, the stray capacitance, which is the circuit board capacitance, that is in parallel with the crystal. So remember we talked about capacitors in parallel add and capacitors in series is the product over the sum. And that's what we have right here. So what is the loading capacitance? Remember, we're trying to match it. Well, it's these two in parallel in series with these two in parallel. All right, so this capacitor is those two added together times those two added together. So it's that squared. That's an exponent, squared, divided by two of the sums of the pin and the loading capacitor. And then because stray is in parallel, we add the stray capacitance. All right. Now, when we do this equation, there's a problem. And the problem is we know what CL is because that's in the crystal data sheet. We're going to make assumptions for the stray capacitance, and we're going to make an assumption for the pin capacitance. And so, I'm going to give you the results in the next little slide of the Excel spreadsheet where I calculated something on the order of three picofarads if it's soldered on the board, six picofarads if it's in a socket for the pin capacitance, and I did two picofarads for the stray capacitance. I put this into an Excel spreadsheet. There's a function called solver. So I don't want to expand this and solve for CX. I have Excel, so I can just put these into cells, click Solver, and the value for CX will appear. And so here is that sheet. I'm going to uh, put this up, and you can make a screen capture and copy of it. So all you need to do is if you go find a crystal, and it's you can't remember if it's at 18, is it 11, is it 22, is it 33? Just look on this chart, figure out if you want to put it in a socket 
or saw on the board, and I'll have the value of the cap that you need. Just remember 5% tolerance on these caps. So here is a little Excel spreadsheet I did that shows for various crystal C sub L loading data what the C loads are for each of the two capacitors based on if it's in a socket where capacitance of the pin is 6 picofarads or it's soldered to the board capacitance of the pin is 3 picofarads. You will find that C sub L generally is from 10 to 27 picofarads. If it's not in this chart, well, I gave you the equation, you can figure it out. I did this by using the solver function built into Excel. For all these capacitors, the load caps are 5% 100 volt NPO or COG dielectrics. And don't forget, there's two of these. So for example, the most popular one is 18 picofarad. There's our magic 30 picofarad for each loading cap. That's why I said in a lot of cases it's the perfect value. Notice it's perfect if you're soldering the board, but if you're doing DIY stuff, you need to use 27 puff. Remember, let's take into account the capacitance of that socket. Take a screen capture of this, generate your own chart for the extra size, five points extra on the next test. Now, back to the whiteboard. So now we're gonna discuss the main thing people asked me about was, all right, I've made the same mistake that tens of thousands of other people have made. I had an 18 picofarad loading cap and the bill of material called out 18 picofarad loading caps. So I have all three the same. That's a series of about nine minus the pen minus plus the stray. So I'm really low. My caps are really low. What does that mean for me and my design? Well, the number one thing that matters is you will not be running at the frequency you think you're running. All right, so if you have a 12 megahertz crystal, and if you were to actually measure the frequency of the oscillator, and we'll talk about that in a second, what that entails, it's not as simple as you think. It won't be 12.00 megahertz. What will it be? Well, if your loading capacitors are too small, the frequency runs too fast. If your loading caps are too big, the frequency runs too slow. How much? Well, that's a pretty complicated thing to do, and there's lots of crystal app notes that will tell you that equation. It has to do with two more capacitance, as we haven't even talked about, inside the crystal, all right? That's called the body mode capacitance and the shunt capacitance, which have to do with how the crystal is actually cut Side note, there's two main cuts of crystals, the AT cut and the SC cut, and they're cut at 35 degree angles from each other, and you can read all about that if you're so inclined. I'm not. You're just going to have to take my word. Now, why is it so difficult to measure the frequency? That's because your scope probe has capacitance when you touch it to a point. Now, usually this capacitance is pretty small, 10 picofarads maybe, 1530 on some old X1 scopes, all right? But that is on the order of the loading capacitor, and you're putting that in parallel on one side of the crystal when you poke your probe on it, right? Which makes the capacitance double probably, and that's gonna pull it to the wrong way, and you're going to read something that's not correct. Now, a lot of microcontrollers have an output pin that you can program to be either the crystal frequency or a multiple, like one fourth of it. Some baud rate generators, you can output what they call the baud rate clock. So if you're running 14.4 baud, you can do the calculation and figure out how accurate does that run. Now, RS-232 is a little bit forgiving. Usually it's plus or minus 3% on the crystal frequency. So in a lot of cases, people would make baud rate generators with like 1.8432 or 3.58 or 11.192, I think it is. And they would not run at the right frequency, but it's close enough, so it's good enough for me. But if you want it to be on frequency exactly, it's only guaranteed at matching 
within a tenth of a picofarad the C sub L and your loading C sub L. Anything else is going to what we call pull. You may have heard the term, we're going to pull the crystal like you're stretching it like a rubber band. And you use a lot of pulling in crystals in color video circuits. When you're trying to match exactly the color burst frequency, 3.57945, I can remember that, but I can't remember my zip code or my wife's birthday, but I remember that. And so generally you have a tuning capacitor, which is a little tiny thing like a trim pot, but it's a capacitor. And that capacitor, you generally are watching color bars. And so you turn until you like the color bar frequency. And like tuning your guitar, if it's in tune, it's in tune. But we don't have that luxury in most cases. We just want it to run. And again, a lot of times the actual clock that's running down in your microcontroller code, maybe you're looking for a one millisecond tick or a hundred microsecond tick or something really long, 50 millisecond tick. And you really don't care if it's 49.93 milliseconds or 50.14 milliseconds. You go, well, it's around 50, all right? So you'll never see the problem. A lot of times in audio, let's say you want to run at 44.1, all right? And you don't run exactly at 44.1. Well, what happens is maybe your codec has a phase lock loop with a buffer and it's trying to sync it up. And as long as you're close, it's fine. So in many, many cases, having the wrong capacitors, meaning your frequency is off, and it's usually off on the high side, you're running too fast, doesn't bother your application. Now, it bothers me because it's wrong, all right? So why would you do something wrong? Let's make everything right. Let's put the correct parts in. But that's just the frequency, but you're going to have another problem. And this is when I get the phone calls as an FAE. When I was at Microchip, I got this phone call all the time. And that's is, it doesn't start up all the time. What does start up mean? That means they turn it on and the crystal oscillator doesn't run. Well, that's not true. What happens is, is the microcontroller doesn't run the code. And that's because in most modern microcontrollers, internal the crystal oscillator, there's a comparator that looks at the amplitude of the clock. There's a duty cycle checker that checks the duty cycle because if your loading caps are off, it's going to change your duty cycle. This is really true on 32 kilohertz, where it can change at plus or minus 30% based on the wrong loading. But that also changes the startup time. And that's the time from when you apply power to the Pierce oscillator that the feedback loop, because the crystal's in the feedback loop, it doesn't just go boom to a square wave in a billionth of a second. It has to kind of oscillate up, okay? And if it doesn't get to the internal threshold of your microcontroller, it still could oscillate, but the amplitude is wrong. It doesn't start up. This is a big problem. Now, usually the startup time has to do with the crystal loading being too big but there's also a threshold at the bottom end where if you're too small. And like I showed in that TI app note where the guy complained his ARM processor wasn't running all the time, he was probably using 18 puff crystals, 20% that were on the low end, so they were really closer to like 15 picofarads and there just wasn't enough loop gain to oscillate. Remember, it's in the feedback loop and what does the loop gain have to be? bigger than one. The other thing that affects you is the temperature drift of the crystal. Now when you say crystal, that automatically implies I've got low drift. That's why I have a crystal. If you have a ceramic resonator, you go it's cheaper, but it's drifter, and it goes all over the map, and it's not as accurate, but I saved a quarter. But we want our things to be stable. And again, there's a very large calculation it has to do with the parasitic capacitance, the shunt capacitance, the body capacitance of the crystal, where you can calculate if you're off by a delta CL, how many picofarads are off, what is the temperature coefficient happen? Now, generally speaking, with the things we do, they're at room temperature. They're not even outside. They don't go minus 40 plus 85. 
But if you're doing something under the hood of a car, military, I used to design stuff for military electronics, where you have to go from minus 55C to plus 125C within spec, you have to really match this loading capacitance or you will drift out of the spec of your product. I don't think this is gonna be a problem with the things that most people do, but certainly these two things are, and this is the answer to your question, what happens when my loading capacitors are wrong? Your frequency is wrong. Does it matter? I don't know. Does it work great for you? Only you will know. Now let's go talk about the last thing I want to discuss is the mysterious 30 picofarad capacitor. Truth or fiction? Well, let's go to Mouser and find out. So here we are back at Mouser, and what I've done is I've typed in 30 picofarad capacitor, ceramic, just to see if something came up. And sure enough, all these values did come up. And notice that we have lots of voltages, surface mount packages, but we also have radial. So I'm going to look at, again at radial capacitors because those are the most common, 5% and 100 volts. There's four remaining. Let's apply filters and see what we can find. Scroll down. We're going to get for the cheap one. And here we go. So we have some AVX and some Kemet parts. Notice that these two are not stocked, right? So that's why we're going to go back and check in stock. I don't know why they even show that. So we have two choices, an AVX and a Kemet. And let's look. Sure enough, they're 30 picofarad, 5%, 100 volts. So what's the difference? It's probably the lead spacing. So let's look at the first part number. Scroll down, and it's 2.54 millimeters. So that's a tenth of an inch lead spacing for the AVX. And let's back up and check the Kemet. Scroll down, 2.54, they're interchangeable. Now, that's the only choice they have. So if your board doesn't have 2.54, tenth of an inch lead spacing, you may have to get out the needle nose pliers and do a little bending. But the good news is that they do have it in through hole. They have it in surface mount. There are 30 picofarad capacitors that you can buy off the shelf at Mouser. I apologize for not looking closer, but not everyone's perfect. Now. Let's go back to the whiteboard. Well, thanks for tuning in to my little bonus of a bonus episode, wrapping up our crystal. This is our last free episode. I hope that you found this content useful and informative and for my wife's sake, willing to pay for. So go to patreon.com slash synthesis technology and sign up. I have a $2, a $10 and a $25 level. These things that I've talked about with the crystals or the level of content you will see at the $25 level. The $10 level is for pure newbies. You don't even know a resistor from a toaster oven, all right? So this is going to be a long series of lectures over the period of a year where you start out with nothing and you wind up with a Moog ladder filter in your hand that you laid out and you sent off for boards and you bought the parts and you soldered it together and you can tell all your friends what every single part does, why it's that value, and how to make it run on 9 volts or 5 volts or 24 volts or 300 volts if you had to. Kind of exaggerated that last part about 300 volts. The $25 level assumes that you've built some kits before. You have basic electronic knowledge, but you didn't know this stuff here now, did you? No, you didn't. And don't pretend you did either. I know who you are. You don't fool me. It's going to have some stuff about my experiences in industry. My favorite story about it works great for me. But something else I'm excited about, and I'm trying to wrap this up for the end of June for the first one, 
is I'm going to be interviewing some people behind the scenes at famous synthesizer companies to get their historical perspective on what they had to go through at the time they were designing the circuits we all know and love, what kind of constraints they did to get the product out the door. I think you'll find it pretty interesting. So until next time, thanks again. See ya.